Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. As I continue this series of murders that took place in the area of Ontario, Canada during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, I had to come back and revisit this story real quick because of a comment on the video that I did about the murder of Lynn Harper. Someone commented that they believed that the police rushed a verdict, rushed a an arrest and conviction of this 14 year old boy in order to just cover this crime up or maybe not so much cover it up, but, but to just kind of get it out of the public's um, mind. Maybe because they didn't want to put fear into the public. Maybe they really believed he was guilty, but I had to go back and kind of revisit that. So I went to Reddit web sleuths and some other comments to look to see what other people were saying. Here's just a few thoughts on this before I move on to the next story. The police didn't in, didn't investigate, really. They didn't really like go out and talk to or really interrogate this Alexander Kalachuk. Despite the fact that only weeks before Lynn Harper disappeared, he had been arrested for trying to lure a little girl into his car. He had also been accused of exposing himself to some children in the neighborhood, and his superiors at the Air Force Base were aware of this. And in fact, the day that Lynn Harper disappeared, they were sitting down and having a discussion about him. So in their minds, they had to have had some questions about him. So I wonder if they were, if the police, the local police, were getting pressure from them to hurry, hurry this up and charge this 14-year-old boy with this crime to take the heat off of the Air Force and the, the superiors for not wanting a, a scandal on the Air Force base. And how did the parents of these two children feel? Lynn Harper, who was murdered, and... Scott Truscott, who was charged with her murder, both of their fathers were in the Air Force, lived and worked on this base. Did they know this Kalachuk? Had they heard the rumors about him? Did they know that he had spent time in jail for these types of crimes? And did, he, did either one of them come out and ask the question, is it possible that he may have been involved in this? I don't think that... Um, Lynn Harper's family did because I believe that they believed that Scott Truscott was the killer. I think that the that the local police were getting pressure from the Air Force and from um, those in power to hurry this story up, get a get an arrest and a conviction. And the fact that they overturned the death sentence a year later says that, is it possible that they had no intentions of hanging this boy and that this was all just a way to rush this verdict? Maybe they didn't know that the, that the jury or whoever it was that sentenced him to hang would offer that sentence. They may have thought that they would just give him life in prison. And the fact that they overturned that conviction, and then 10 years later, he got parole. It sounds almost like someone knew that he was not guilty, or really believed that he was not guilty. And once the public had their criminal, once they had their arrest and conviction, 
they went back to normal. The, the community went back to their normal routines. And this man, this Alexander Kalachuk, if he was the culprit, was free to come and go. He did go into a mental hospital. And this could have been part of the arrangements that the Air Force made with him. You know, we're getting all these stories about you. You're going to jail. You're you're being accused of exposing yourself to, to exposing yourself to children. Go into the hospital, spend some time in the hospital, get treatment. And this was their way of kind of saying that they were doing something about this man. Was he really the killer? And by not really investigating him, did they allow him to go on to kill other children? They said that he was a suspect in the death of Susan Cadeau, who was killed three years earlier. Had they really investigated him at that time and found that he could have been the killer of her, he would have been in prison and Lynn Harper would not have been murdered. That's the way a lot of people were looking at it. If they believe that uh, this Alexander Kalachuk was responsible for the murders of both Susan Cadeau and Lynn Harper, those were three years apart. Where was he at during those three years? What base was he stationed at? Was he overseas or outside of Canada in a different country with the Air Force? Uh, wherever he was at, were there murders taking place in those areas as well? Did anybody research any of this? We know that they didn't research any of this during the murder after the murder of Lynn Harper. And is this one of the reasons why they destroyed all of the evidence in her case? Now, this is the story of Jacqueline Dunleavy. Jacqueline Dunleavy was born in 1952 in London, Ontario. She was the daughter of John and Emily Dunleavy. She was 16 years old on the evening of January the 9th, 1968, when she was finishing up her shift at her job at the Stanley Variety Store. Now, this store will come into play later. Um, it factors into her story. A lot of people, the police, believe that some of the people that frequented this store could have been her killer. On Tuesday, January the 9th, 1968, Jacqueline Dunleavy was working at the Stanley Variety Store. She finished work at about 6.35 p.m. and she was last seen walking out of the store. Now, she was last seen actually at a bus stop a couple of blocks from this store. Jacqueline locked up the store and headed out into the dark evening on her way home. She had to walk two blocks to the bus stop. Witnesses reported seeing her waiting for the bus at the bus stop, but one man said that a white four-door sedan that looked like a Chrysler pulled up to the bus stop and she got in. She would get off work at around 6.30 at night and she would walk to the local bus station a couple of blocks from the store. This was her routine. But that evening, someone reported seeing her getting into a car. So I don't know if the bus, if she had missed the bus. They said the weather was kind of cold that day, so maybe she was just tired of waiting. But someone pulled up in a white car, and she got in the car. They described the car as a white, they believed to be a Chrysler. This will come up again later, too. After she didn't return home at around 7.30 or 8 o'clock that night, her dad, who was a police officer, went into the police station. Well, he, he actually got out and drove around looking for her. He went to the store, the bus station. He didn't see her anywhere. Her mom called around some of her friends, and no one had seen her, so he reported her missing. At around 8.30 that night, just two hours after she was last seen, three boys found her body in a parking lot nearby. 
So let's let's think for just a minute. This could have been a customer who waited outside of the store, watched for her to come out, followed her over to the bus stop and offered her a ride home. And it might have been someone that she was familiar with. Some people even suggested that it could have been the owner of the store. But it, more than likely, it was someone that she was familiar with who came into that store and she maybe accepted a ride from them. So her parents became concerned when she didn't come home. They began to call the store. They called the bus station. They called her friends. But her father, who was a constable, started driving around where she would have been. He drove around to the store, the bus stop, and along from the bus stop to the to his back to his home and thinking that possibly he had missed her and that she may have been walking. But there was no trace of her, so he went to report her missing. About an hour later, around 8 p.m. that night, about five miles away from the bus stop where she was last seen, three boys pulled into a parking lot of the Oak Ridge Plaza. They discovered the gruesome remains of Jacqueline Dunleavy. The left side of her face had been bashed in, and the scarf that had been used to throttle her was still around her throat, so she had been strangled to death with a scarf. Her clothes had been torn off and were thrown all around her body. Her skin was covered in scratches from fingernails. The scene featured some bizarre and unsettling details. Jacqueline's winter coat was found near her remains, and it was stained with vomit and semen. She had been grotesquely posed after death, lying stiffly on her back with her eyes open. They believed that it was possible that because the left side of her head had been attacked and beaten, that the man probably did this while she was still in the car. Now, her body had been dragged because there were drag marks from where a car would have been parked. There was... Four mismatched tire prints, which they believed all came from one car, but they said that there were drag marks out to where her body was found. So they believe that this man dragged her out of the car and left her body there. The authorities brought in special tools and took photographs and they made plaster casts of the impressions of the tire marks. And they said that these were four different makes of tires. And they said that this car had a very bad alignment problem and that it was probably a clunker, just an old junk car that maybe someone had, maybe someone bought cheap just, you know, at, for this very purpose to pick people up so that they wouldn't be seen picking someone up in their own car. A tremendous amount of forensic evidence was found at the crime scene, including blood, semen, the tire impressions, and the fact that Jacqueline had thrown up on her own coat. The, the autopsy revealed that the left side of Jacqueline's face and head had been severely beaten. Her body had been scratched repeatedly by what looked like fingernails. Now, there was no indication that she had been raped, but she had been strangled with her own scarf. Now, you remember that Lynn Harper was also strangled with her own blouse. Now, they said that there was no indication of rape, however, and this is going to be somewhat graphic, so if you have children in the room or if you're you know, if you don't want to hear this, they said that her coat had vomit on it and a man's semen. Now, police at the time believed that it was possible that this perpetrator, this murderer, had forced her to perform oral sex. Now, 
the coroner discovered a plastic-wrapped pack of pink facial tissues had been crammed down her throat. The skirt that she was wearing, that she was still wearing her skirt, but it had been pulled up to expose her, and her blouse was torn open, leaving her exposed. And this was a way for this person to um, humiliate her after her death. Now, there's one more element to this. Um, this killer wanted her body to be found. He didn't take her out into the deep, dark woods. The, this, this girl was exposed and laid out in an open parking lot. And this was at like 7, 7, between 7 and 7.30 p.m. In the, in the night. It wasn't late at night, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So whoever this was... It was almost like, you know, he, he knew she would be found and he wanted her body to be found. Now, here's another part about this that they say. Jacqueline's remains, during the autopsy, they found a pack of pink facial tissues that had been crammed and lodged down into the back of Jacqueline's throat. Now, the, the authorities believe that this could have been used as a gag to keep her quiet, to keep her from screaming, but others believe that this was symbolic. Now, keep in mind, as it was stated earlier, semen was found along with vomit on her coat, and this led them, some people, to believe that he used these tissues, that he had planned to actually use the tissues to clean himself, um, they believe that he could have forced her to perform this and that she became sick and threw up and this could have angered him and caused him to strangle her. Whoever had killed Jacqueline had clearly not been concerned about being seen or about the body being discovered. The victim's remains had not been concealed and the parking lot was, um, very, it was on a busy place even on cold winter nights. Deep marks in the snow suggested that the perpetrator had dragged Jacqueline's body about 50 feet from his car to the spot where she was dumped and had then returned to his car afterwards, gotten her belongings such as her backpack and boots and dumped them out next to her body. Police were able to obtain impressions of the vehicle's tires which indicated that there were four different tires on the car. They all had a different tread, and they were all a different type of tread. They also concluded that the vehicle was badly out of alignment, and they were surprised that the car could maneuver at all because it was so badly out of alignment on the snow. The vehicle would have been distinctive, and authorities were confident that they would have no trouble tracking down such a car. They went looking for every junker and every car with four mismatched tires, but sadly they came up with nothing. The Stanley variety where Jacqueline had been working was, um, for she'd only been working there for about a month, so I believe that whoever was whoever killed her was someone who came in and out of that store and saw her there and was they knew what time the store closed. They knew what time she would be leaving to go to the bus. This seemed like a possible venue for suspects. Only a few days into the investigation, several regulars were looked into. One of them was a middle aged man who came into the store quite often and would go watch these porn films in the back the, this man had reportedly made advances toward Jacqueline as well as a few of the other young girls who worked there and he was also known to be quite intoxicated at most of the time most of the time many of the customers were considered persons of interest and one customer in particular who would come there to pay on this pay-per-view basis to watch these porns had a fixation with Jacqueline. 
he would become very drunk and flirt with her to the point that she became uncomfortable anytime he came into the store. They said that he was violent. They said that he had spent some time in reform school when he was a young younger child because he... Um, now, this is what they say about this man. They don't name him. He's never named. But when he was a juvenile, apparently he had abducted or lured a seven-year-old little girl and he hanged her and they said that he masturbated while she was dying and he watched her die and he was caught and he was put into reform school this man was a juvenile at the time that this took place so he was convicted but he was only sentenced to four years and then he was released on his 18th birthday now, psychiatrists reported that uh, psychiatrist reports said that they recommended that he be kept in jail, but the system saw fit to release him. Keep in mind, the place where her body was found was a school. The parking lot was a school for children with learning disabilities. So could it be possible that he was hanging around this place looking for young kids that maybe he could grab now here is one suspect joe clark now he was the owner of this store the owner of the store where jacqueline worked employed pretty teenage girls to work at the front counter this was a, a way of bringing in business older men would come in and drink coffee uh, younger boys would come in they would buy stuff just to be able to come in and talk to these girls Middle-aged and, and uh, other aged men would come in and flirt with these girls. And, of course, we know about the rumors and the accusations that he was uh, showing these films in the back. So this would bring in an element of men. But the store sold everything from groceries, hardware items, households, on-the-go uh, on beverages, such as soda and that type of stuff but this was also a pawn shop the clientele at the variety store where she worked offered numerous potential suspects the stanley variety store was a magnet for some of the shadiest characters around london they also offered special customers access to illegal cosmetics stolen items and porn films on a pay-per-view basis shortly after jacqueline's murder joe clark sold the store and left town now some people believe that this was a, a way because he he may have been guilty and he wanted to hurry up and get out of town despite the encouraging number of leads in the case by the london ontario police the investigation would quickly come to a halt and exactly one month later another similar crime took place a mile away and they believe that a budding serial killer was on the move these pink tissues will come up again later in another murder and um, they believe it was the same person as I said before some of these people were strangled with their articles of their own clothing. Their bodies were posed and their clothing was laying, laying on the ground around them. So many people do believe that this was a same serial killer. Even though none of these cases have ever been solved. I read this earlier today. I wasn't aware of this, but I, I was reading about this involving this case. It's one of the reasons why a lot of these cases have not been solved using DNA is that they restrict the use of DNA in like genealogy. In Canada, the way I read it was these are uh, the use of this DNA is restricted, and so the police don't have the same access as they might here in the United States. And I don't know about other countries, if any other cases come up in other countries, I'll read about that. 
but unless they have the DNA uh, off of a body and they put it in there, um, they can't just go into genealogy databases searching for DNA that would match. I hope that makes sense. This one is the story of Frankie Jensen. This is a little boy. At a little past 8 a.m. on the morning of Friday, February the 9th, 1968, nine-year-old Frankie Jensen bundled up against the cold, carrying his lunchbox, and set out to school. He actually hadn't wanted to go to school that day because he had been having problems at school with bullies. But his parents and siblings urged him to go and... Ordinarily, Frankie's older sister would have walked with him the half a mile, but she happened to be running late that day, so Frankie set out alone for Westdale Elementary. The wooded path that he took was a common shortcut for children walking to school, and though a handful of little boys had reported being chased by a, a man on the path, it doesn't appear that any reports were taken seriously at all. Now, there was a psychiatric hospital nearby there. Police said it was probably just some of those men and that the children were just afraid of them. So they didn't really take it seriously, and they just kind of thought these kids were making up these stories. Frankie never arrived at school that morning, and when he failed to come home that day, his anxious mother reported him missing. The following morning, hundreds of police officers and citizens turned out to look for him. They searched the woods where he had reportedly been seen walking to school, and investigators at first discounted the uh, an abduction. They believed that the boy had simply wandered off or that he was hiding somewhere. Despite the fact that temperatures were in uh, freezing that night, and that he would not have been able to have survived overnight. Whatever the case was, there was no trace of him. Various sightings of him were reported, but none of these ever proved to be legitimate, and weeks went by with no clue as to the whereabouts of his, and um, his family band together to form a coalition of safe havens. Now, the townsfolk, the people in the community, all got together and they put signs in their windows telling children that this was a safe house. And if they felt frightened, if they felt someone was chasing or following them, that they could come to that house and they would be given a safe haven. And they were frustrated with the police because the police had not taken these reports seriously when they first started to come in about someone following the children, chasing the children. Someone reported that they had seen a car the morning before Frankie disappeared, that they had seen a car idling near the path where the children walked to school. This was, um, the vehicle was described as a white sedan, possibly a Chrysler. Now this was the same car that was reported in the Jackie Dunleavy disappearance. And police were now forced to face the possibility that the two crimes could have been related. Not long after this, another local teenager would go missing. This is the story of Scott Lashman. 16-year-old Scott lived in the rural community of West Missouri, not far outside of London, Ontario. On March the 21st, nearly two months after Frankie Jensen vanished, Scott was home from school for spring break. He decided to go outside and enjoy the warm temperature of the day and decided that he would go fishing. At around 4 p.m., a witness saw Scott on a country road around Forest City carrying a fishing pole and tackle box. He had been hitchhiking as many teenagers in the area did at that time, and a witness stated that Scott had been seen getting into a white sedan. 
Scott was never seen alive again, and though his body would not be found for quite some time, on April the 12th, 1968, the question of where little nine-year-old Frankie Jensen had gone would finally have an answer. More than two months after he disappeared, his body turned up. Two men canoeing in the Times River near West Missouri discovered the child's body caught in a barbed wire fence near the shore. Investigators concluded that the child's body had become entangled in the fence and uh, had his body not become entangled in the fence they believe his body would have been swept out and lost forever the boy was found clad in his buttoned shirt and undershirt but his paints were found in the water nearby police determined that the prob that the Okay, here's the police's theory, because they've been right about so much so far. They believe that his paints became uh, removed from his body because of the water's current. Not the fact that it was possible that a predator had taken his paints off. Frankie's lunchbox overcoat and his broken thermos were found floating in the river nearby but his boots were never found. An autopsy was performed, but a definite cause of death could not be established. Frankie had clearly suffered a blow to the head, but it was uncertain as to what really killed him. They thought that his body may have been dumped off of the nearby bridge. There was no sign of a sexual assault, but the body had been in the icy water for quite some time. One chilling detail that would seem to link him to Jacqueline Dunleavy was that Frankie was also found to have pink facial tissues wadded up and stuffed down his throat. Now, this was the same color and type of tissue that was found in the throat of Jacqueline Dunleavy. So it's, and the fact that this other boy, this Scott, who was fishing, have been fishing in that same waterway, also went missing after being seen getting into a white car. Here's three possible victims of the same person. Investigators were reluctant to make the claim that this was the the work of one person. They couldn't deny the fact that the de the detail of the tissues was was not random. They wanted to say that this was a possible copycat. This is the reason why a lot of police don't give out all of the details in a murder case like this, because. If something like this turns up later in another case, they wouldn't be able to say that it was a copycat. On May the 21st, 1968, exactly two months after 16-year-old Scott Lashman was spotted getting into a white car, his remains were discovered in Big Otter Creek. 60 miles away from where he had last been seen. As in the case of Frankie Jensen, it appears that Scott had been thrown off of the bridge into the water. Postmortem exam suggested that he had still been alive when he went into the water. It was also speculated that the, a killer had attempted to dispose of the body in such a way that the current would carry it into Lake Erie. But just like Frankie's body it had become trapped and was not swept away. There were other eerie similarities between the two boys. Most of Scott's clothing and belongings were not found on his body. They also once again said that the, the Swiftness of the water had taken his clothing off of his body and washed it away. 
Others believed that the killer had taken the clothes off of the body and taken the clothes with him. Some believed that they had kept these clothing and the boots as souvenirs, but I would say that they probably removed the clothing during a sexual assault or some other type of perverted um, act and disposed of the clothes when they were done. Now, this is just something that is absolutely mind-blowing to me, and I'm sure to other people, is that the police wanted to say that the killer had taken the boy's clothes off of their body and then redressed them, or, or not so much taken their clothes off of their body, but unbuttoned and unbuckled their clothing so that it would be easier for the clothing to wash away. This was their theory. Frankie nor Scott had been raped, according to the coroner, but who's to say that they weren't? Just like with Jacqueline Dunlavey, who's to say that this wasn't an oral sexual assault? Um, but others say that there had to have been something about the fact that both boys' trousers had been removed from their bodies. There were no pink tissues discovered in Scott's throat. However, investigators believed that they had both been murdered by the same person. Nus Alsop. He was convinced that the homicides of both Scott and Frankie were related and had been carried out by the same person and that this was someone who had a very specific sexual deviance. He believed that the man lived within walking distance of Frankie's home and knew what time the child left for school and what time the, the other children in the area were, would be out walking to school. And the fact that that morning his sister was running late and didn't walk with him. So there was a individual that he thought was probably a very promising suspect but he was never named by the media. This man was a traveling salesman who moved into the area only a few years earlier. He lived two streets away from Frankie's family. He had previous convictions for exposing himself. His background was enough that investigators were able to get a search warrant for his property, and they found some interesting clues. First of all, a white sedan, much like the ones reported in the crimes, was found inside the garage. The car appeared to have been very well cleaned, and police were able, able to recover a string of blonde hair from a floor mat. A box of pink tissues exactly like the ones found in Frankie's throat and Jacqueline's throat, along with a newspaper article about Jacqueline's murder, were found in the uh, home of the, uh, this man. This strengthened their suspicions about him. And third of all, the suspect's work Record for February the 9th, the day Frankie disappeared, was found to have been falsified. All clients that the individual claimed he visited that day stated that no one had been to their home that day, although the work record showed that the, on the day of Scott Leishman's disappearance, that the man um, was in the location, according to his own work records, that he was in the location close to where Scott was abducted. And he would have been in that area at that same time. Detectives were certain that they had found their man, but the lack of compelling physical evidence frustrated their efforts to charge him with murder. And it didn't help matters that the man had a habit of checking himself into mental hospitals just when police seemed to be closing in on him. Dennis Alsop kept tabs on the suspect as he moved from city to city and hospital to hospital. 
So Dennis Salsop, he followed this guy around, and he, he watched him, and this man would check himself into mental hospitals. And this seems to be a recurring theme here. The area where Jacqueline's body was found was said to have been either in the parking lot of a mental hospital or nearby. And this was very close to the area where Frankie Jensen went missing. Could it be that this man, being familiar with mental hospitals in the area, kind of knew that there were schools nearby there? Maybe he was the one that had been chasing these children through the woods, these little boys. They can never prove it, even though they had what I would consider to be overwhelming evidence. The tissues, the similar car... Now, in today's uh, forensics, they probably would have been able to have found fingerprints, DNA, but this was the 1960s, and I don't know how advanced they were. But Dennis Salsop really believed that this neighbor, who was a traveling salesman, and this kind of brings to mind this Stanley Variety store where Jacqueline Dunleavy worked. Could this man, a traveling salesman, have come in and out of that store could he have been a delivery person a purchaser i don't know it's it's rare that you have a serial killer that targets both male and female but then again it could have been a matter of convenience for this person and while most of the people who were murdered in this area were girls and and young women there were more young men as well and I don't know if it was the same person or not. I find it hard to believe that it was, but I do think that both Michael Arntfeld and Dennis Salsop both believed that this neighbor of Frankie Jensen's was responsible for his death and probably Scott Leishman's as well. Um, the fact that both of their bodies were thrown into the river, or at least both of their bodies were found in the river with their clo part of their clothing removed. And Jacqueline's body had been left out in the parking lot on display. It kind of makes you think that this was not the same person. And while the police would, all, would say that there was no signs of sexual assault, I believe that there was. I believe that there was oral sexual assault in these cases. And possibly, the you know, the fact that both of these young men had their paints removed, there could have been sexual assault. Maybe they just didn't know what they were looking for at that time. But either way, none of these cases have been solved, and there's a few more stories that I'm going to cover in this series, and then I'm going to move on and get back to my roots of Appalachia because I have several stories ready to go um, locally, more locally to Appalachia. But I wanted to cover this. This all started with the, uh, the story that I started out with, the young boy, Kurt Newton, who went missing, and this kind of led into these stories of, of Canada because it was so close to the same area. These cases, like I said before, have never been solved. And um, thanks for watching.